We're very pleased, uh, brothers and sisters, to have Brother Dave Ionelli, who's been a part of the Brooklyn Bethel family for some 30 years now, and he and his wife have come to us from the Howard Beach Congregation in New York City. Brother Ionelli is going to be delivering a most important theme for us to listen along to. His title, Encouraging One Another as the Day Draws Near. Brother Ionelli. Um, before I begin, I would just like to say how encouraging it is for my wife and me to look out and see so many of you here this afternoon. We recognize that this is an extra meeting for you, and we do really, really appreciate um, how many are here today. Thank you for that. We would love to get acquainted with you, so please don't be shy. You know, come up, introduce yourself, reintroduce yourself. If we met you at Mesa four or five years ago, we really would like to get acquainted with you, if at all possible. And to break the ice, I'll tell you just a little something about us, and then maybe you'll tell us something about you. My wife and I were both born and raised in New York City, uh, right in the shadow of Bethel. When we went to Bethel, we stayed in the same congregation. And Joanne and I have a long history together. We've been married for 35 years, but when I was about five years old, and Joanne four years old, her mother conducted the Bible study with my mother. So I like to tell people that it was kind of an arranged marriage, you know. <laughs> but the reality is Joanne was not able to step foot in a kingdom hall until she was 14 years old because her father was opposed to the truth. Now there's a whole lot more to that story, but you can ask Joanne. I'm sure she would be delighted to tell you. Now that's just a little something about us. Let us learn something about you, please, while we're here. But now the theme, encouraging one another as the day draws near. Now, some time ago at headquarters, we received this letter from a sister who was quite down. I'd like to read just a portion of it to you. The first of November, I went into a bad depression. I missed six weeks of meetings straight. During this time, I stayed somewhat active, but my life was still turned upside down. All during this time, no one called or wrote or visited with me or my family to see how things were going. I know the friends care, but with all the pressure of things, they didn't show it. My husband and children still went to all the meetings and they told the elders of my problem but not one of them called me to see how I was doing, not even my book study conductor. As you know, when people are depressed, it doesn't take much for them to feel worse about themselves. Feeling worthless, discouraged, and anxious are all natural feelings. And when no one calls or shows any concern, I assumed that my feelings were justified. I mean, do you know someone who struggles with discouragement, depression? Have you ever felt at a loss as to what to say or do to help? I think we've all been there. And yet, each of us should be concerned with encouraging others. And in our discussion here this afternoon, I'd like to focus on three questions. The questions are why, who, and how? Why should we encourage one another? Who especially should take the lead in doing this? And how? How can you give a little encouragement to someone in need? Well, let's start with why. Why should we encourage one another? Well, there are three important reasons. The first is simply this. Your time will come. Everyone gets discouraged at times. And when your time comes, you're going to want your brothers and sisters to be there for you, right? So it's only fair that you give a little encouragement to others when they need it. You see, as Jehovah's people, none of us are immune to the things in life in this system that can cause us to get discouraged. What things? Well, things like chronic illness or advancing age, which may impose limitations on us. I mean, when you're not able to do what you used to do in God's service, 
when you're not able to do all that your heart wants to do in pleasing God. It's so easy to get discouraged. How about loss of a loved one in death? That too can trigger discouragement. And you know, after a few weeks or months when others have gone back to their normal routine, the feelings may linger. In fact, for years, on the anniversary of the death of your loved one, those feelings might be triggered all over again, and you feel the need for a little encouragement. How about divorce, perhaps from a mate who departed, leaving you struggling with feelings of rejection or worthlessness? What about a brother no longer serving as an elder, perhaps due to family or personal issues? And he struggles with feelings of failure, worried that the brothers might forget all about him. What about someone having financial difficulties? And in the present economic climate, that's a, a reality for many, right? You think of a brother loses his job and he struggles with worrying about, is he going to be able to hold on to the house? How's he going to provide for his family? And he feels like his very manhood has been undermined because he's not able to provide for his family as he would like to. How about shortcomings, your own or those of others? These too can get us discouraged at times. I mean, you might be battling a personal problem and you have a setback and the guilt can be overwhelming. Or it might be the shortcomings of others that get you down. You know, a thoughtless or unkind remark or act uh, when you come into the truth, you hear so much about the love that identifies Jehovah's people, and we can get our expectations built way up. And then you run into a thoughtless or unkind remark from someone who's supposed to love you so much that he would give his life for you. And it can really, really be unsettling. And finally, more than a few of our precious brothers and sisters may get discouraged at times because of the emotional scars they carry stemming from childhood abuse. For example, uh, some may have experienced childhood sexual abuse, and they've tried to stuff down the feelings, hoping that they will go away. But feelings buried alive just never die. The point is, for one reason or another, whether it be the things I've mentioned or countless others, for one reason or another, sooner or later, your time will come. And when it does, you're going to want your brothers and sisters to be there for you, so it's only right that you be there for them when they need encouragement. Now, a second reason we ought to encourage one another is this. The Bible commands us to do so. Let's turn to our theme text at Hebrews chapter 10. Now, we often apply these words of Paul to Christian gatherings, such as the one we're at right now. But the reality is, what Paul says here in principle really applies whenever Jehovah's people come together or associate together. Hebrews chapter 10, let's start reading with verse 24. Paul says, And let us consider one another to incite to love and fine works, not forsaking the gathering of ourselves together, as some have the custom, but now here's what we'll focus on, but encouraging one another, and all the more so as you behold the day drawing near. Now note that to stress why it's so important that we encourage one another, Paul refers to the day drawing near. What day is that? Well, if you have the New World Translation with the cross-references, you'll notice at the end of the verse the cross-reference symbol. And if you go to the middle column, the two scriptures cited under that symbol, the second of them is 2 Peter 3.12, where the Bible talks about Jehovah's coming day to execute judgment on this system. So Paul says, encourage one another all the more so, because that day is drawing near. In other words, what Paul is saying here in very real terms is this. When Jehovah's day to execute judgment on this wicked world comes, 
we don't want to lose any of our brothers and sisters because they got discouraged along the way and just gave up. Now, before that day gets here, we need to be encouraging one another as never before. So the Bible here commands us to encourage others. Now, the third reason we ought to encourage others is this. Christian love demands it. Christian love requires it. You might turn, please, to 1 John chapter 3. And we'll take a look at the words recorded at verse 17. Now, the setting here, the Apostle John is really discussing material support. That is, coming to the aid of a brother who is in need of material help. But what he says here, in principle, can be applied even when a brother is in need of emotional support, such as a need for encouragement. 1 John 3, we'll look at verse 17. But whoever has this world's means for supporting life and beholds his brother having need, and yet shuts the door of his tender compassions upon him, in what way does the love of God remain in him? Now let's take a closer look at John's words here. You notice in the beginning of the verse, about the third line down, he talks about someone who beholds a brother having need. Now in the original Greek, the word here rendered beholds according to scholars, means not simply to casually glance at something. Rather, it refers to a deliberate gaze, a very careful observation. In secular writings, this Greek word was sometimes used to describe a general inspecting his army. And you can be sure, he doesn't just look casually. He studies his soldiers from head to foot. And so the picture John paints here is this. Can you imagine a brother who beholds or very carefully observes in his brother a need, say a need for encouragement, and yet instead of helping, he shuts the door of his tender compassions and turns away? No, John says. Christian love could never allow us to do that. Encouragement is an expression of love. Christian love requires, in fact, demands that we encourage one another. So why encourage one another? Remember, three reasons. Your time will come. The Bible commands us at Hebrews 10. Christian love requires it. Now this brings me to the who question. Who should encourage others? I mean, obviously we all should be doing this, but if we had to single out one group of men in the congregation who must take the lead in doing this, it would have to be the elders. Elders, we must encourage our brothers. Why? Well, there are two very important reasons. Number one is because Jehovah expects this of elders. And to establish that, you might turn, please, to Isaiah chapter 32. In a prophecy that is having a beautiful fulfillment in these last days, notice how it describes those who would be taking the lead among Jehovah's people. Isaiah chapter 32, and we'll look at verses 1 and 2. The prophet writes, Look, a king will reign for righteousness itself. And as respects princes, they will rule as princes for justice itself. And each one must prove to be like a hiding place from the wind and a place of concealment from the rainstorm, like streams of water in a waterless country, like the shadow of a heavy crag in an exhausted land. Well, let's take a closer look at the prophecy and its meaning. In verse 1, it refers to a king who would be reigning. And since 1914, who is this installed king? Somebody tell us, who is this king reigning since 1914? Not a trick question, please. 
This is Jesus Christ. Well, if Jesus Christ is the king, who are the princes mentioned in this prophecy? Well, it helps if we can fix the time when the prophecy is fulfilled. Now, the prophecy here is not so much describing the new world, but rather the last days. Now, why do we say that? Well, the prophecy in verse 2 talks about Jehovah's people needing a hiding place from the wind, a place of concealment from the rainstorm. They need shadows. And you can't imagine that God's people would need protection from the elements in the new world. The prophecy is describing things that should be happening today among God's people. Well, if Christ is the king in heaven, then who on earth in the congregations of Jehovah's people would be represented by the princes? Who would you say? Who are the princes then if Christ is the king? Please, Sister Muncie, just call it out. That would be the elders, right. And how are the elders to treat the flock? Well, the prophecy says they should be a hiding place, a concealment, a shadow, like streams of water. Uh, in, in other words, sources of relief, refreshment, or, put simply, encouragement. Now, how important is it, in God's eyes, that elders encourage the flock? Well, look at the beginning part of verse 2. It says, and each one, that is, each prince, each elder, must prove to be sources of encouragement or refreshment to their brothers. These are not suggestions. These are requirements. Jehovah God has gone on record in his word in this prophecy, saying that in the time of the end, in the congregations of his people, there would be men who would care enough about his sheep to be sources of refreshment and encouragement to them. So elders, when we reach out and offer encouragement to a brother or sister in need, you know what? We're actually having a part in fulfilling this prophecy, fulfilling what Jehovah said elders ought to be. Uh, may we never be like the elder I once heard of. A brother came to me and he was quite distraught over the way an elder had been treating him. And he said, you know what? He said, that brother is not a hiding place from the wind. He is the wind. May that never be said about us as elders. But now a second reason why we as elders ought to take the lead in encouraging the flock, it sets an example that the rest of the sheep can follow. Now, some years ago, a brother sent in this letter to headquarters, and in it, he referred to something that he had observed many times. I'd like to read it to you. He writes, I worked on a sheep ranch for a while, and we would often play a game with the sheep. I would put a stick out in front of the lead sheep, and it would jump over the stick. He said, then they would take the stick away. And can you guess what happened? He said, every sheep would jump at the same spot, even though the stick was no longer there. It was amusing, but it was a valuable lesson in dealing with people, especially if you are in a lead position. What you do, your sheep will follow. But it works the other way also. What you don't do, you can't expect others to do. So as elders, when we take the lead in encouraging the flock, it sets an example that the rest of the flock can follow and reach out and encourage one another and how beautiful that is to see in a congregation. So who especially must take the lead in encouraging others? The elders. Why? We've noted two reasons, right? Number one, Jehovah expects it of us elders. That prophecy in Isaiah 32 clearly shows it. Second, it sets an example that the rest of the flock can imitate in encouraging one another. But now this brings me to the third and final question, and we'll spend most of our time answering this one. It's actually the more difficult of the questions to answer, and it is how. How can you encourage others? Now, we don't always know what to say or do. I mean, have you ever been in that situation? 
you see a brother, you hear of a brother, and you know that he's probably going through a hard time, you would like to help, but you just don't know what to say. And when you don't know what to say, what sometimes, maybe more than sometimes, happens? We say nothing, right? We shy away. And then we tell ourselves to make ourselves feel better. Well, you know, there are probably a lot of people there right now. So, Or, you know what, if we don't go, we won't be missed. Or maybe they don't really want people there right now. I think of a sister I knew many years ago. Her young son had died. And she told me something that I thought was so interesting. She said, you know, after my son died, I noticed that a number of the brothers and sisters in the congregation actually kept away from me for a while. But she wasn't bitter. She said, I know that they love me. What I sensed is that they didn't know what to say or do, and that's why they were keeping away. Well, you cannot encourage others by keeping away, right? So again, the question is, how? How can you encourage others? Well, we're going to consider four scriptural suggestions. And these four things are simple things. You do not need a degree in psychology or psychiatry. You don't need special training, special knowledge, special education. If you want to encourage your brothers in need, follow your heart and these four simple scriptural suggestions. Suggestion number one, you can encourage others by your presence without saying one word. Now, how could that be possible? Well, let's look at a scriptural example. If you turn, please, to Acts chapter 28. The setting here, the Apostle Paul is being led to Rome as a prisoner. And he's approaching the final leg of his journey. Now, the final stretch of land was through an area that was swampy, a Roman poet made the same journey a century before Paul, and that poet wrote about the villainous water that upset his stomach. He also wrote about the huge frogs and the angry mosquitoes that wreaked havoc on him and his party. Well, now the Apostle Paul was arriving over that stretch of land. The brothers in Rome knew that Paul was coming. So the question is, would they wait in the comfort of their homes in the city for Paul to get into the city and then come out to meet him? Interestingly, that's not what they did. Now with that background in mind, let's pick up the account at Acts chapter 28 and we'll look at verse 15. And from there, that is from Rome, the brothers, when they heard the news about us, came to meet us as far as the marketplace of Appius and three taverns. Now we might pause there for just a moment. The marketplace of Appius was a post station about 46 miles southeast of Rome. And for a man traveling on foot, that was about a two-day journey. So a group of brothers from the city traveled, walked two days outside the city so they could be waiting for Paul there at the marketplace of Appius. And then they would walk with him the two days back to the city. Now the Three Taverns was a rest stop about 36 miles southeast of Rome on the same road, so about 10 miles closer to the city. A second group of brothers were waiting at the Three Taverns. And then they would join the others and with Paul walk together back to the city. Now just put yourself in Paul's sandals, as it were. And here you are coming through this difficult journey. You get to the marketplace of Appius, and there you see your brothers and sisters waiting for you. How did that affect Paul? Well, look at the latter part of verse 15. And upon catching sight of them, Paul thanked God and took courage. Isn't that interesting? The mere sight of those brothers, without a word, just the sight of those brothers, was an encouragement in itself for the Apostle Paul. What's the lesson for us? The lesson, friends, is you too 
can encourage others by your presence without saying one word. Now, how is that possible? Let me share an experience with you that my wife and I lived through that I think illustrates the point. Uh, this was in the summer of 1973. Joanne and I were newly married. We had a sister in our congregation, a single mother, who was raising six children, five girls and one boy. The boy was uh, 13 years old. Well, that summer, 1973, the family decided to take a little vacation in upstate New York, the Lake George area, a little over 200 miles north of the city. There was a family up there that had moved from our congregation. That family also had a son, 13 years old, and the two boys were the best of friends. So while they were visiting up there in Lake George, one morning the two boys went out to play, and by the afternoon they had not returned back to the house, and the mothers started to worry. As the time wore on, the boys still had not returned, and now people really started to worry. A search party was organized. The brothers and others searched through the night, and sad to say, the next morning, they found both boys at the bottom of a cliff where they had fallen to their death. Now, the sister decided to hold the funeral for her son right where they were in upstate New York so that the two boys could be buried together. Now, when word of that tragedy reached our congregation in New York City, I have never seen a more emotional scene at a Christian meeting as I saw following that meeting. So much was this young boy loved. Now, it would have been easy for the brothers in our congregation to reason, surely the mother doesn't expect us to go up to the funeral. It's 200 miles away. It would have been easy for them to reason, if we don't go, we won't be missed. But that's not what happened. On the morning of the memorial discourse, a group of brothers and sisters from our congregation in New York City met at our Kingdom Hall, and then a caravan of cars left our hall and made the four or five hour drive north. And my wife and I were in that caravan. Now when those cars pulled into the lot of the Kingdom Hall in Lake George, New York, where the funeral discourse was to be held, and the brothers and sisters from our congregation got out of their cars and they walked into that kingdom hall, I can tell you from what the mother later told me, they did not have to say one word. Their presence there was an encouragement in itself. And all these years later, do you think for a moment that that mother can remember anything that any of us said to her that day? Probably not. But you know what she does remember? She remembers that we were there. You can encourage others by your presence without saying a word. To take another example, uh, some years ago I interviewed a sister whose husband and 18-month-old daughter were in a, a terrible car accident. Actually, the little girl was killed instantly and the husband badly injured. Well, the sister later told me this. I'd like to read it to you. As soon as the accident happened, the brother that was at the house, he called one of the elders, and within an hour, the lobby of the hospital was filled with our friends, all the elders and their wives. There were probably 50 people there within an hour. Some of the sisters were in curlers, some were in their painting clothes. It was, they just dropped everything and got there as quickly as they could. There was no feeling of, well, someone else will be there with them, or they don't want to see us right now, or we don't know what to say. A lot of them told us that they didn't know what to say, but it didn't matter because they were just there. Again, you can encourage others by your presence without saying one word. Now, do you need any special education in order to do that for others? You don't need any special training. This is something that any, really, all of us can do. Now let's talk about a second way to encourage others. This is based on what we read at James chapter 1 and verse 19. I think as soon as we read the verse, you'll know instantly 
what the second suggestion is. James 1, verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers, every man must be swift about hearing, slow about speaking. What's the second way to encourage your brothers? Be a good listener. Why? Very simple. Because people who are discouraged often need to talk. Now a good example of this, if you turn over to Job chapter 10. Now you talk about having reasons to be discouraged. You think about Job and all that he was put through, right? And yet in the midst of this, let's note what Job says. We'll look at Job chapter 10 and verse 1. And Job himself is speaking here. The patriarch says, My soul certainly feels a loathing toward my life. I will give vent to my concern about myself. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. Now, you notice that expression there in the middle of the verse, I will give vent to. In the Hebrew, it literally means to let loose. And the tense of the verb in the Hebrew implies a determination. And so that's why the New World Translation says, I will give vent to. In other words, Job was saying he would not keep all of this inside of himself. Rather, he was determined to let it loose, to give vent to it. And how would he do that? Well, he says next in the verse, I will speak. Job needed to talk. The lesson for us? People who are discouraged often need to vent. They need to let it loose. They need to talk. Talking can be therapeutic. Uh, feelings, it seems, are more manageable when you vent them, when you can share them verbally, rather than when you try to stuff them down. How can you be a good listener? Well, here are two important suggestions to keep in mind. If you want to be a good listener, number one, resist the tendency to tell the other person how to feel. Now, sometimes our nature is to say, oh, there, there, don't say that or don't feel that way. Well, you know, feelings aren't always right or wrong. They just are. So resist the tendency to tell people how to feel. Second thing to keep in mind if you want to be a good listener is don't be too quick to try to fix what's wrong. Because in most cases, you probably can't fix it anyway. And especially those of us who are elders, you know, so often we strap on our tool belts, you know, and uh, we think that it's our job to come up with the perfect Watchtower article or scripture that will just solve this problem and make it disappear. And in the real world, it just doesn't work that way all the time. I mean, for example, think about a brother who has lost his mate of many years in death. And he finds himself struggling with confusing feelings. I mean, times when he's angry even at God, he's angry at his wife for dying, then he feels guilty because of the anger. Think about a sister living in a religiously divided home. I mean, the holidays, birthdays, her heart is divided. You know, she wants to make her husband happy, but she cannot compromise her faith, and she feels torn. How about a sister abused as a child? And she's grown up carrying enormous feelings of guilt and shame. Can we fix those problems? I mean, we can't resurrect the brother's wife. You can't force the sister's husband into the truth. You cannot go back into a sister's childhood and erase the abuse that was perpetrated upon her. We can't fix those problems. Jehovah can fix those problems. And he will at the very latest in the coming new world. Meanwhile, what such individuals may need is not superficial advice on how to fix it. What they may need more than anything else is simply to talk, to talk to someone who will listen without judging them. 
Does listening really help? Indeed it does. Think, for example, about a circuit overseer we had in the New York area some years ago, and he told me about a congregation he visited where a sister came up and she said, uh, I need to talk with you, brother, please. And he set up some time where he could uh, talk with her later in that week. And the brother later told me, the traveling overseer, he said, I didn't talk with her at all. He said, I sat there and listened as this sister poured out her heart for almost three hours. And when she was all done, this dear brother looked at her and asked, have you been able to talk to any of the brothers locally about these things? And her answer was rather interesting. She said, no, brother. You're the only one I thought I could talk to who would not think that I'm crazy. She needed to talk, but to someone she knew would listen without judging her. I think of uh, an elder Joanne and I met in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, uh, Louisiana some years ago. We were serving a congregation, and the brother who was the city overseer of Baton Rouge came up to me, and he, was, he had his experience to share. He said, you know, some years ago I got home after the service meeting one night, telephone rang, and there was a distraught sister on the line. He said, now Dave, I listened for 40 minutes as she poured it out. He said, now I'm telling you, Dave, all I said was, uh-huh, is that so? And after 40 minutes, do you know what she said to me? She said, brother, you have no idea how much you have helped me. <laughs> Expressing the value of being a good listener, one doctor put it this way. It's almost poetic. This is entitled simply, Listening. When I ask you to listen to me and you start giving advice, you have not done what I asked. When I ask you to listen to me and you begin to tell me why I shouldn't feel that way, you are trampling on my feelings. When I ask you to listen to me and you feel you have to do something to solve my problem, you have failed me, strange as that may seem. Listen. All I asked was that you listen, not talk or do, just hear me. Advice is cheap. A quarter will get you both Dear Abby and Billy Graham in the same newspaper. And I can do for myself. I'm not helpless, maybe discouraged and faltering, but not helpless. When you do something for me that I can and need to do for myself, you contribute to my fear and inadequacy. But when you accept as a simple fact that I do feel what I feel, no matter how irrational, then I can quit trying to convince you and can get about the business of understanding what's behind this irrational feeling. And when that's clear, the answers are obvious, and I don't need advice. Irrational feelings make sense when we understand what's behind them. So please, listen, and just hear me. And if you want to talk, wait a minute for your turn, and I'll listen to you. <laughs> your presence and your willingness to listen without judging are probably the two best ways to encourage your brothers. Now, do you need any special training, any special education, any special degrees to be able to do this? Of course not. These are things that any of us as Jehovah's people can do for those in need of a little encouragement. Well, now, sooner or later, you do have to say something, right? So this brings me to the third suggestion. If you want to encourage others, speak consolingly. Now let's see what the Apostle Paul said about this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and we'll look at verse 14. Paul writes, On the other hand, we exhort you, brothers, admonish the disorderly. Notice, speak consolingly to the depressed souls. So if you want to encourage a brother or sister in need, and if you're going to open your mouth and say something, 
the Bible here says, by all means, speak consolingly. What does that mean? Well, the original language word translated consolingly means to comfort, to soothe, to cheer up. And you might be thinking, well, you see, that's exactly the problem. I don't know what to say to comfort, soothe, or cheer up someone in need of encouragement. Well, please remember this. The kindest words are so often the simplest of words. If you want to speak consolingly to a discouraged or depressed soul, here's three simple things to keep in mind. Number one, express your care and concern. Simple words like, I'm so sorry to hear what happened. Or, you know, I don't know what to say, but I just wanted you to know that I really feel for you. I mean, you think about the sister whose letter I read at the outset. During all that time, no one called, no one said anything. If someone had called and simply said, you know, I'm so sorry, how are you doing? I I just wanted you to know I feel for you. Perhaps it would have made a difference. Second suggestion to speak consolingly is this. Simple words of reassurance can do wonders. Words like, Don't be afraid to express how you feel. Words like, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to be here for you. Words like, I won't be judgmental. Now, why are such words of reassurance so helpful? Well, the individual may have a problem with trusting people. I mean, very often, if people have been hurt or disappointed or beat up in Satan's world, they grow emotionally numb. They may put up emotional walls, and they're not likely to let anyone in. People are more likely to open up and talk if they feel safe, if they feel that the one speaking to them will not judge them for what they say or feel. A third suggestion to speak consolingly. Offer a simple prayer. Just pray with the person. I can't help but reflect on my mother's own experience uh, of many years ago. I have an older brother. My brother Frank is two years older than me. And then there's me. And then my mother had a series of miscarriages after I was born. Over a period of years, she had a total of five miscarriages in all. And it was uh, emotionally a very difficult time for her because she really wanted another child. Well, I remember I was just a boy, and after one of those miscarriages, uh, one of the elders in the congregation came to make a shepherding call on my mom. And my brother and I were there. And I'll never forget it. This dear brother was uh, from Europe. He hadn't even graduated grade school, but he had a heart as big as all outdoors. And what he did that my mother found so consoling is he held her hand and he prayed with her in our hearing. And that simple prayer made such a difference to her. Now, why? Why pray in the hearing of a discouraged brother or sister? Well, you would be amazed at how common it is for even a fellow worshiper at times to be feeling so low that he actually feels unworthy to pray for himself. Your prayer in his hearing can do so much to encourage. What do you pray for? Keep it simple. It could be as simple as asking Jehovah in the hearing of this individual, asking Jehovah to help this dear one to know how much he or she is loved by Jehovah and by the brothers and sisters as well. So if you're going to open up your mouth and speak, speak consolingly. Remember, simply express your care and concern, offer some reassurance, say a simple prayer, and you will be speaking consolingly. Now, the fourth and final suggestion to encourage others, this has to do with what you do not say. Avoid speaking thoughtlessly. Now, let's look at what the proverb says about this. Proverbs chapter 12 And we'll take a look at verse 18.
Proverbs 12 and verse 18. The wise man writes, There exists the one speaking thoughtlessly as with the stabs of a sword, but the tongue of the wise ones is a healing. So here it says, avoid speaking thoughtlessly. What does that mean? Well, the word here rendered thoughtlessly means to babble, to talk idly or unadvisedly. Now, the words are not necessarily malicious. They're not necessarily intended to harm. But they're thoughtless, and they end up harming anyway. Now, why avoid speaking thoughtlessly? According to the proverb, it stabs like a sword. Thoughtless words can hurt. They can kill friendships, and they can actually wound people spiritually. Now, let me give you some examples. Uh, To a sister who has had a miscarriage, words like, Oh, sister, you know what? You can always have another baby. Thoughtless words can stab like a sword. Another baby will not replace this baby that she perhaps has felt kicking and moving within her. Here's another one. Say a sister who's had a miscarriage. I understand how you feel. Now let's take the case of two elders making a shepherding call on a sister who's had a miscarriage. You see where I'm going with this? They do not have a clue as to how she feels. And to even suggest that they do, those would be thoughtless words that could end up stabbing like a sword. Another example, I knew a sister at Bethel some years ago. She told me about uh, something her mother had experienced when her sister died. So this mother lost her adult daughter in death, and the daughter left behind small children. Well, the mother was out in field service a few weeks after the death of her daughter, and in the car group, one of the sisters said this. Now, it's hard for me to imagine that anyone could say these words imagining that they would help. But this sister said, I know how you feel. You know, my dog just died. I mean... You you never want to minimize how attached someone can be to a pet. But to a mother, to equate the loss of a pet with the loss of a child, thoughtless words can stab like a sword. Uh, For another example, I talked with a sister some years ago. Her daughter battled an eating disorder, anorexia. At her worst, the mother told me, her five-foot-four-inch daughter weighed less than 50 pounds. Her circulation was so bad that when she would come to the meeting, her parents would sit on either side of her, and each of them would put one of her hands inside their hands to try to infuse some warmth into her. Well, the girl would kind of seesaw a little with her weight, so at times she would put on a few pounds, then she would lose the weight, put it on, lose it. And during one period where she'd put on just a few pounds, The girl came to the kingdom hall and someone walked up to her before the meeting, pinched her on the cheek and said, oh, it's good to see a little meat on those bones. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out. It's the worst thing to say, right? Thoughtless words can stab like a sword. And one more example. To a victim of childhood abuse who's struggling with the painful emotional scars of the past, Words like, snap out of it. The past is the past. Thoughtless words can stab like a sword. Uh, One sister who went through this very thing wrote to headquarters and she expressed it this way. Just recently when I was going through an emotionally difficult time, I had an elder say to me, snap out of it. The past is the past. What do you expect out of us? And this sister writes in her letter this, I don't expect anything but love and kind words. Again, thoughtless words can stab like a sword. Well, how can you avoid speaking thoughtlessly? Well, there are two things that can help. The first is so obvious I shouldn't even have to say it. 
right? If you want to avoid speaking thoughtlessly, think before you speak. And it helps to remember that the two best ways to encourage others do not involve speaking at all, right? Your presence and your willingness to listen. So don't put yourself under pressure to say anything. If you're not sure of what to say, don't say anything. And by your presence and your willingness to listen, you might still be able to offer some encouragement. Now the second suggestion to avoid speaking thoughtlessly is this. Keep up with the publications of the faithful slave. Now why do we say that? Well, you know, in the last 20 or 25 years, our journals, The Watchtower and Awake, have featured articles on social, emotional, and family issues, the kind of subjects that, frankly, 40 or 50 years ago, our brothers at headquarters would never have dreamed would even be necessary. I mean, our magazines have dealt with subjects like eating disorders, depression, child abuse, domestic violence, obsessive-compulsive disorder, panic attack, social phobias, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, mood disorders, self-injury, or cutting. Now, why are such articles published? Well, basically for two reasons. One, to help the brothers and sisters who may be struggling with these issues. Do you know what the other reason is why such articles are published? To educate the rest of us so that we can have some sense of what some of our brothers and sisters are dealing with. For example, about five years ago, the January 8th issue of Awake carried some articles about understanding mood disorders, dealt with such things as uh, severe depression. And among the letters that came into headquarters from some of our readers were these two. One sister wrote, I have read many articles in your magazines that have touched me, but none as much as this series. As I read of our brothers and sisters who suffer with these disorders, my heart went out to them. If I have ever said anything insensitive to such ones, I hope that they can forgive me. Please continue publishing articles like these. They help all of us to be more loving and understanding. And then another wrote, I always considered depression to be selfish, something that a person just needs to snap out of. But after reading these articles, I realized that by not being considerate of others' feelings, I was actually the one being selfish. Avoid speaking thoughtlessly, and keeping up with the publications can be a great help to that end. Well, by way of review, why should we encourage one another? Remember, we considered three reasons, right? Number one, your time will come. Number two, the Bible instructs us to do this at Hebrews 10, 25. Number three, Christian love requires it. You can't shut the door of your heart and turn away, as 1 John 3, 17 noted. Now, who especially should encourage others? We noted the elders, right? And why? Two reasons. Number one, Jehovah expects it of elders. In fact, he even foretold that elders should do this. And two, the elders can thereby set a good example that the rest of the flock can imitate. How can you encourage one another? How can you give a little encouragement to others? Remember the four scriptural suggestions. Number one, by your presence, without saying a word. That was based on Acts 28.15. Number two, listen without judging, James 1.19. Number three, by speaking consolingly, 1 Thessalonians 5.14. And number four, by avoiding speaking thoughtlessly, Proverbs 12.18. When you give of yourself, to encourage someone else, you actually help yourself in the process. Unselfishness has its own rewards. As Jesus said, there's more happiness in giving than there is in receiving. When we encourage one another, friends, 
we tighten the cords of love and pull our congregation closer together. And may that be true of your congregations here. May you pull ever closer together because you are encouraging one another, and all the more so as that day draws near. Thank you. Brother Ianelli, I'm sure I speak on behalf of the nearly 300 people that are here today that we certainly appreciated that, uh, those comforting reminders from the scriptures, and we appreciate it so much. The uh, North Oceanside and Valley View congregations are invited back tomorrow on the other side, uh, Kingdom Hall, for our public talk, watchtower, and a special service talk. Brother Ianelli will be giving the public lecture entitled, Gaining Comfort in All Our Tribulations. And then we'll have our watchtower. And our closing talk by Brother Ianelli is entitled, You Are Worth More Than Many Sparrows. And so again, the Valley View and Oceanside North congregations are invited to that program. We now are uh, going to invite everyone that's able to stand to, to do so. We have song number 89 from 1 John 4.